Chapter 11 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter 11 Percy Bysshe Shelley. Percy Bysshe Shelley, the son and heir of a wealthy English baronet, Sir Timothy Shelley, of Castle Goring in the county of Sussex, was born at Field Place, near Horsham, in that county, on the 4th of August, 1792. Ushered into the world in the midst of wealth and fashion, with all the advantages of family distinction, the future of Shelley's life appeared a bright one but the sunshine of the morning only served to render the darkness which came over his noontide more dark, and to make poor Shelley still more susceptible of the hardships he had to encounter. First educated at Eton, his spirit there manifested itself by an unflinching opposition to the fagging system, and by revolt against the severe discipline of the school. In his Revolt of Islam, Shelley has thus portrayed this feeling. I do remember well the hour which burst my spirit's sleep. A fresh May dawn it was when I walked forth upon the glittering grass, and wept, I knew not why, until there rose from the near schoolroom voices that, alas, were but one echo from a world of woes the harsh and grating strife of tyrants and of foes and then i clasped my hands and looked around and none was near to mock my streaming eyes which poured their warm drops on the sunny ground so without shame i spake i will be wise and just and free and mild if in me lies such power for i grow weary to behold the selfish and the strong still tyrannize without reproach or check and from that hour did i with earnest thought heap knowledge from forbidden minds of lore yet nothing that ray tyrants knew or taught i cared to learn but from that secret store wrought linked armor for my soul before it might walk forth to war among mankind from Eton, Shelley went to Oxford, and while there he, scarce at the age of eighteen, published a volume of political rhymes entitled Margaret Nicholson's Remains, the said Margaret being a woman who tried to assassinate George the Third. He also wrote a pamphlet in defense of atheism. A copy of this pamphlet he caused to be sent to the head of each of the colleges in Oxford, with a challenge to discuss and answer. The answer to this was the edict which expelled Shelley from Oxford, and at the same time placed a wide chasm between him and his family. This breach was still further widened in the following year by his marriage at the age of nineteen with a beautiful girl named Westbrook. Although Miss Westbrook was respectfully connected, Shelley's aristocratic family regarded this as a mesalliance and withdrew his pecuniary allowance, and had it not been for the bride's father, who allowed the young couple two hundred pounds a year, they would have been reduced to actual poverty. This was an unfortunate marriage for both. After having two children, disagreements arose, and Shelley was separated from his wife. She, like all beautiful women, was soon attacked by the busy tongue of slander, and, unable to bear the world's taunts, committed suicide by throwing herself into a pond just four years from the date of their marriage. Shelley, on this account, suffered much misery and misrepresentation, and this misery was much increased by his family, who applied to the court of chancery, and obtained a decree by which Shelley was deprived of the custody of his children, on the ground of his atheism. The same spirit even now pervades the Shelley family, and scarce a copy of his poems can be found in the neighborhood of his birthplace. 
Shelley afterwards contracted a second marriage with the daughter of Godwin, the author of Caleb Williams, and Mary Wollstonecraft, who died in giving birth to Shelley's wife and for some time the poet resided at marlow in buckinghamshire where he composed the revolt of islam and it is a strong proof of the reality of shelley's poetical pleadings for the oppressed amongst the human race that he was indefatigable in his attentions to the poor cottagers of his neighborhood and that he suffered severely from an attack of ophthalmia which was originated in one of his benevolent visits nearly the first of shelley's poems was his queen mab in which having in vain struggled to devote himself to metaphysics apart from poetry he blended his metaphysical speculation with his poetical aspirations the following quotations are taken from that poem in which his wonderful command of language is well shown there's not one atom of yon earth but once was living man nor the minutest drop of rain that hangeth in its thinnest cloud but flowed in human veins and from the burning plains where libyan monsters yell from the most gloomy glens of greenland's sunless clime to where the golden fields of fertile england spread their harvest to the day thou canst not find one spot whereon no city stood how strange is human pride i tell thee that those living things to whom the fragile blade of grass that springeth in the morn and perishes ere noon in an unbounded world i tell thee that those viewless beings whose mansion is the smallest particle of the impassive atmosphere think feel and live like man that their affections and antipathies like his produce the laws ruling their mortal state and the minutest throb that through their frame diffuses the slightest faintest motion is fixed and indispensable as the majestic laws that rule yon rolling orbs how bold the flight of passion's wandering wing how swift the step of reason's firmer tread how calm and sweet the victories of life how terrorless the triumph of the grave how powerless were the mightiest monarch's arm vain his loud threat and impotent his frown how ludicrous the priest's dogmatic roar the weight of his exterminating curse how light and his affected charity to suit the pressure of the changing times what palpable deceit but for thy aid religion but for thee prolific fiend who peoplest earth with demons hell with men and heaven with slaves thou taintest all thou look'st upon the stare which on thy cradle beamed so brightly sweet were gods to the distempered playfulness of thy untutored infancy the trees the grass the clouds the mountains and the sea all living things that walk swim creep or fly were gods the sun had homage and the moon her worshipper then thou becamest a boy more daring in thy frenzies every shape monstrous or vast or beautifully wild which from sensation's relics fancy culls the spirits of the air the shuddering ghost the genie of the elements the powers that give a shape to nature's varied works had life and place in the corrupted belief of thy blind heart yet still thy youthful hands were pure of human blood then manhood gave its strength and ardor to thy frenzied brain thine eager gaze scanned the stupendous scene whose wonders mocked the knowledge of thy pride their everlasting and unchanging laws reproached thine ignorance a while thou stoodst baffled and gloomy then thou didst sum up the elements of all that thou didst know the changing seasons winter's leafless rain the budding of the heaven-breathing trees 
the eternal orbs that beautify the night the sunrise and the setting of the moon earthquakes and wars and poison and disease and all their causes to an abstract point converging thou didst bend and called it god the self-sufficing the omnipotent the merciful and the avenging god who prototype of human misrule sits high in heaven's realm upon a golden throne even like an earthly king and whose dread work hell gapes forever for the unhappy slaves of fate whom he created in his sport to triumph in their torments when they fell earth heard the name earth trembled as the smoke of his revenge ascended up to heaven blotting the constellations and the cries of millions butchered in sweet confidence and unsuspecting peace even when the bonds of safety were confirmed by wordy oaths sworn in his dreadful name rung through the land whilst innocent babes writhed on thy stubborn spear and thou didst laugh to hear the mother's shriek of maniac gladness as the sacred steel felt cold in her torn entrails religion thou wert then in manhood's prime but age crept on one god would not suffice for senile puerility thou framedst a tale to suit thy dotage and to glut thy misery thirsting soul that the mad fiend thy wickedness had pictured might afford a plea for sating the unnatural thirst for murder rapine violence and crime that still consumed thy being even when thou heardst the step of fate that flames might light thy funeral scene and the shrill horrent shrieks of parents dying on the pile that burned to light their children to thy paths the roar of the encircling flames the exulting cries of thine apostles loud commingling there might sate thy hungry ear even on the bed of death but now contempt is mocking thy gray hairs thou art descending to the darksome grave unhonored and unpitied but by those whose pride is passing by like thine and sheds like thine a glare that fades before the sun of truth and shines but in the dreadful night that long has lowered above the ruined world speaking of the atheist's martyrdom in answer to the spirit of iantha shelley makes his fairy say there is no god nature confirms the faith his death grown sealed let heaven and earth let man's revolving race his ceaseless generations tell their tale let every part depending on the chain that links it to the whole point to the hand that grasps its term let every seed that falls in silent eloquence unfold its store of argument infinity within infinity without belie creation the exterminate spirit it contains is nature's only god but human pride is skilful to invent most serious names to hide its ignorance the name of god has fenced about all crime with holiness himself the creature and his worshippers whose names and attributes and passions change seva buddha for jehovah goa or lord even with the human dupes who build his shrines still serving o'er the war polluted world for desolation's watchword whether hosts stain his death blushing chariot wheels as on triumphantly they roll whilst brahmins raise a sacred hymn to mingle with the groans or countless partners of his powers divide his tyranny to weakness or the smoke of burning towns the cries of female helplessness unarmed old age and youth 
and infancy horribly massacred ascend to heaven in honour of his name or last and worst earth groans beneath religion's iron age and priests dare babble of a god of peace even whilst their hands are red with guiltless blood murdering the while uprooting every germ of truth exterminating spoiling all making the earth a slaughter-house ianthe's spirit however asks still further and the ghost of ahasuerus having been summoned the question is repeated is there a god ahasuerus is there a god ay an almighty god and vengeful as almighty once his voice was heard on earth earth shuddered at the sound the fiery visaged firmament expressed abhorrence and the grave of nature yawned to swallow all the dauntless and the good that dared to hurl defiance at his throne girt as it was with power none but slaves survived cold-blooded slaves who did the work of tyrannous omnipotence whose souls no honest indignation ever urged to elevated daring to one deed which gross and sensual self did not pollute these slaves built temples for the omnipotent fiend gorgeous and vast the costly altars smoked with human blood and hideous moans rung through all the long-drawn aisles a murderer heard his voice in egypt one whose gifts and arts had raised him to his eminence in power accomplice of omnipotence in crime and confidant of the all-knowing one these were jehovah's words from an eternity of idleness god awoke in seven days toil made earth from nothing rested and created man i placed him in a paradise and there planted the tree of evil so that he might eat and perish and my soul procure wherewith to sate its malice and to turn even like a heartless conqueror of the earth all misery to my fame the race of men chosen to my honor with impunity may sate the lusts i planted in their heart here i command thee hence to lead them on until with hardened feet their conquering troops wade on the promised soil through woman's blood and make my name be dreaded through the land yet ever burning flame and ceaseless woe shall be the doom of their eternal souls with every soul on this ungrateful earth virtuous or vicious weak or strong even all shall perish to fulfil the blind revenge which you to men call justice of their god the murderer's brow quivered with horror god omnipotent is there no mercy must our punishment be endless will long ages roll away and see no term oh wherefore hast thou made in mockery and wrath this evil earth mercy becomes the powerful be but just o god repent and save one way remains i will beget a son and he shall bear the sins of all the world he shall arise in an unnoticed corner of the earth and there shall die upon a cross and purge the universal crime so that the few on whom my grace descends those who are marked as vessels to the honour of their god may credit this strange sacrifice and save their souls alive millions shall live and die who ne'er shall call upon their saviour's name but unredeemed go to the gaping grave thousands shall deem it an old woman's tale such as the nurses frighten babes withal these in a gulf of anguish and of flame shall curse their reprobation endlessly 
yet tenfold pangs shall force them to avow even on their beds of torment where they howl my honour and the justice of their doom what then avail their virtuous deeds their thoughts of purity with radiant genius bright or lit with human reason's earthly ray many are called but few i will elect do thou my bidding moses in his poem of rosalind and helen the poet indulges in the following prophecy which he puts in the mouth of helen fear not the tyrants shall rule for ever or the priests of the bloody faith they stand on the brink of that mighty river whose waves they have tainted with death it is fed from the depths of a thousand dells around them it foams and rages and swells and their swords and their sceptres i floating see like wrecks on the surge of eternity beside the poems mentioned shelley wrote the cinci alastor prometheus unbound and many others including a beautiful little ode to a skylark and the well-known sensitive plant shelley was a true and noble man no poet was ever warmed by a more genuine and unforced aspiration de quincey says Shelley would, from his earliest manhood, have sacrificed all that he possessed for any comprehensive purpose of good for the race of man. He dismissed all insults and injuries from his memory. He was the sincerest and most truthful of human creatures. If he denounced marriage as a vicious institution, that was but another phase of the partial lunacy which affected him for to no man were purity and fidelity more essential elements in the idea of real love again de quincey speaks of shelley's fearlessness his gracious nature his truth his purity from all fleshliness of appetite his freedom from vanity his diffusive love and tenderness this testimony is worth much the more especially when we remember that it is from the pen of thomas de quincey who while truthfully acknowledging the man hesitates not to use polished irony rough wit and covert sneering when dealing with the man's uttered thinkings that shelley understood the true mission of a poet and the true nature of poetry will appear from the following extract from one of his prose essays Poetry, he says, is the record of the best and happiest moments, of the happiest and best minds. We are aware of evanescent visitations of thought and feeling, sometimes associated with place and person, sometimes regarding our own mind alone, and always arising unforeseen and departing unbidden, but elevating study delightful beyond all expression poets are not only subject to these experiences as spirits of the most refined organization but they can color all they combine with the evanescent lines of this ethereal world a word a trait in the representation of a scene or passion will touch the enchanted chord and reanimate in those who have ever experienced these emotions the sleeping the cold the buried image of the past poetry thus makes immortal all that is best and most beautiful in the world it arrests the vanishing apparitions which haunt the interlunations of life, and veiling them, or in language or in form, sends them forth among mankind, bearing sweet news of kindred joy to those with whom their sisters abide. Abide, because there is no portal of expression from the caverns of the spirit which they inhabit into the universe of things shelley's beautiful imagery and idealistic drapery is sometimes so accumulated in his poems that it is difficult to follow him in his thinkings in his verse he wishes to stand high as a philosophical reasoner and this together with his devotion to the cause which even men of de quincey's stamp call insolent infidelity 
has prevented shelley from becoming so popular as he might have been shelley lived a life of strife passed his boyhood and youth in struggling to be free misunderstood and misinterpreted and when at last in his manhood happier circumstances were gathering around him a blast of wind came and the waves of the sea washed away one who was really and truly a man and a poet on monday july eighth eighteen twenty two being then in his twenty-ninth year shelley was returning from leghorn to his home at larishi in a schooner-rigged boat of his own with one friend and an english servant when the boat had reached about four miles from the shore the storm suddenly rose and the wind suddenly shifted from excessive smoothness all at once the sea was foaming and breaking and getting up in a heavy swell the boat is supposed to have filled to leeward and carry in two tons of ballast to have sunk instantaneously all on board were drowned the body of shelley was washed on shore eight days afterwards near via Reggio, in an advanced state of decomposition and was therefore burned on a funeral pyre in the presence of lee hunt lord byron mr trelawney and a captain shenley thus died shelley in the midday of life and ere the warm sun of that midday could dispel the clouds that had gathered round the morning of his career the following comparison made between the personal appearance of shelley and of byron by gilfillan has been called by de quincey an eloquent parallel and we therefore conclude the present number by quoting it in the forehead and head of byron there is more massive power and breadth shelley has a smooth arched spiritual expression wrinkle there seems none on his brow it is as if perpetual youth had there dropped its freshness byron's eye seems the focus of pride and lust shelley's is mild pensive fixed on you but seeing you through the mist of his own idealism defiance curls on byron's nostril and sensuality steps his full large lips the lower features of shelley's face are frail feminine flexible byron's head is turned upwards as if having risen proudly above his contemporaries he were daring to claim kindred or demand a contest with a superior order of beings shelley's is half bent in reverence and humility before some vast vision seen by his own eye alone misery erect and striving to cover its retreat under an aspect of contemptuous fury is the permanent and pervading expression of byron's countenance sorrow softened and shaded away by hope and habit lies like a holier day of still moonshine upon that of shelley in the portrait of byron taken at the age of nineteen you see the unnatural age of premature passion his hair is young his dress is youthful but his face is old in shelley you see the eternal child none the less that his hair is gray and that sorrow seems half his immortality end of chapter eleven of ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers by charles bradlaugh read for you by ted delorme in fort mill south carolina